Hello, Denton here once again. And I'm sure you probably wouldn't guess it, but this, this video will be about battle, about deeds of, of great valor and combat, of the clashing of swords and the shedding of blood. And, well, yeah, I, I, I suppose maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you would have, maybe you would have guessed that that, 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 that is possible. This time, I want to talk about the Battle of Clontarf, that epic 11th century struggle that forms part of the overall history of the Vikings as it relates to Ireland, a struggle that allegedly pitted Norse paganism against Christianity, the Hammer of Thor against the Cross of Rome, a gigantic battle between the evil pagans and the oh-so-pure and noble Irish king who was trying to drive such heathen wickedness out of Aaron's Isle once and for all. A stirring tale, to be sure, and completely wrong. It was actually a struggle between native Dublin Irish and Norse settlers, plus some Vikings, and the land-grabbing king of Munster, Brian Boru, that great romanticised figure from Irish history, made out to be, well, hardly less than a saint, by generations of school teachers, and the heroic leader who drove paganism from the shores of Holy Mother Ireland. Sure now, and isn't that a great story to be telling, so it is. Oh, yes. Except, of course, that there is also a great big load of... Well, well, you know, uh, what, what you might step in if you weren't very careful walking around a cow shed, if you, if you see what I mean. But that's the way the battle has been depicted in history books. But it's very far from the actual facts. And in this video, I shall set the record straight. But this isn't just about the battle itself. Uh, though I, I will be talking about the actual battle and some interesting things connected with it that many people will be unaware of. A battle, as I've said, often wrongly seen as a clash between Irish Christianity and Norse paganism, which it wasn't. And I'll be telling the actual facts about the battle and what led to it. An event very distorted and exaggerated in some ways by decades of one-sided history lessons taught in Irish schools, where the, the notions of romantic Ireland replaced actual historical fact. Oh yes, how, how noble! and romantic it would have been had it actually happened that way. Wrap me in the folds of the green flag of Erin and carry me from the battlefield. Yeah, but it didn't. Though it, it, its actual effect uh, on both the, the history of Ireland and that of the Vikings, uh, an important event in itself, as the battle uh, itself actually was, has been greatly exaggerated, as, uh, as we shall see. But this, this video is also about a, a 20th century theatrical representation of it, and my personal participation in that somewhat, uh, well, shall we say, inglorious uh, event, which I hope will give you a few laughs, because that event, intended to be deadly serious, failed miserably in that regard. See, for some years, I was an actor on the Dublin stage. Yes, darling, I trod the boards, as they say. I appeared in all the major theatres of the city, the Abbey, the Gaiety, the Olympia, the Gate, among them, until the rather precarious and unpredictable employment prospects of the Irish theatre scene at that time decided me to take up an occupation that meant one could work for 50 weeks per year and get paid every week. Yeah, no, that was, uh, that was something. And not have to go to auditions along with 50 other people for the same part or kiss somebody's arse to get it. Oh, yes, oh, yes. The infamous casting couch was alive and well, even in holy Ireland, the alleged land of saints and scholars. I hope that is not too much of a, too much of a shock to you, where knowing someone in both the everyday sense of that word and in the biblical sense of the word was very much a key to success. Now, the Battle of Clontarf took place on Good Friday, the 23rd of April, in the year 1014 AD, at a place called, not surprisingly, I suppose, Clontarf, which in 1014 was an area along the coast of Dublin Bay, some distance from the city to the north, making it an excellent landing place for the Viking ships. Today, it's one of the inner suburbs. 
The battle actually spread over a very considerable area from Clontarf itself right out to Hoth and a distance inland as well. And it was fought between a mixed force of Norsemen and Dublin and Leinster Irish, along with Viking reinforcements and the usurping King Brian Boru of Munster. Now, generations of Irish school children learned how the saintly King Brian Boru fought at Clontarf to drive the Vikings out of Ireland, giving his life in the process, and freeing Holy Ireland from the evil pagans. But in the immortal words of John Wayne, the hell he did, Pilgrim. <coughs> Excuse me. For one thing, King Brian would have been hard put to it to find very many pagans in Dyfflin, as Dublin was called back then. Most of the Norse settlers had converted to Christianity by that time, and they were led by the Hiberno-Norse king of Dyfflin, Sidrig Olafton, known as Silkbeard, himself half Irish by birth and a Christian as well, who later would go on a pilgrimage to Rome in 1028 AD and found Dublin's Christchurch Cathedral around the same time. He wasn't really very much of a pagan to be driven out of anywhere. But the King Brian, you see, far from wanting to drive anybody, pagan or otherwise, out of anywhere to anywhere else, simply wanted the Kingdom of Dublin for himself, already having acquired a few other kingdoms along the way. He, he didn't really care who uh, held Dyfden, he simply, he simply wanted it. But he has traditionally been seen as the noble king who heroically drove the pagans out of Ireland, thus saving the land of saints and scholars from the evils of the dreadful godless heathens. Basically, you know, I, I always find the godless heathens bit very amusing, since the heathens had dozens of gods, while the Christians, well, they only had one. So, oh well, anyway. The Dublin Irish sided with the Norse community, as did King Milmorda of Leinster, reinforced by Vikings under Jarl Sigurd the Stout of Orkney and Jarl Brodir of Man while Brian had the assistance of two kings from Connaught, uh, among others. Now, the Dublin Norse were not, of course, Vikings. That, that's a common popular error, perpetrated in almost every TV show or documentary, because Vikings were only Vikings when ships were involved. Now, the Norse who came down from Orkney and the Isle of Man were Vikings because they came here in ships to do something when they got here. That, by definition, made them Vikings, or Vikinger, as it was in Old Norse. But the Norse living in different, well, no, they, they were simply settlers, townspeople, residents of the city, whatever you want to call them, having nothing to do with going anywhere in ships and doing something when they got there. The term Viking has come quite incorrectly to be used for anyone or anything connected with the peoples of Scandinavia in those days. Even the, the, even the famous or infamous, depending on whether you were in it or were watching it approaching, Viking longship. You know, they didn't actually exist. When it was anchored in harbour, it was simply a longship. It only became a Viking ship when a group of men, and sometimes women, got into it and sailed off to raid, trade, settled, or whatever else they might be doing. The, the ship's Vikingness was only that some people were going Viking in it. The ship was just, well, it, it was a ship. That was it. So, the two Jarls and their warriors, the only true Vikings to take part in the battle, since they did come in ships, landed along the beach at Clontarf at high tide, and they joined up with the local Irish and Norse forces. The two sides met just after sunrise, and the fighting continued until sunset. But before the battle itself commenced, there was one of those two champions fighting each other things so beloved of combat in those days, when a powerful warrior from each side would march out midway between the opposing armies, and they would see who was the better fighter. In this case, it was the draw, since, well, they killed each other. An old account stating that both died with the sword of each through the heart of the other and the hair of each in the clenched hand of the other. Having got the really rather pointless macho bit out of the way, the battle commenced. There is a very interesting and often overlooked aspect to the Battle of Clontarf, and that concerns the Viking Raven Banner. There's one of them up there on my shelves. And these were used by many Viking leaders, among them the Jarls of Orkney, including the aforementioned Sigurd, 
who in the Jarl's saga, there, there is an account of how a, a Volva, a shamanic seer who practiced the art of Seder magic, made a banner for her son, who happened to be Jarl Sigurd the Stout, ruler of the Northern Isles, comprising both the Orkney and Shetland Islands. And sometime before his participation in the Battle of Clontarf, he was facing an army far bigger than his. He was significantly outnumbered, hence his mother's making of the banner, for she had used her magic in the making of it. It was described as being a finely made banner, cleverly embroidered with the figure of a raven, so that when it fluttered in the wind, the raven seemed to be flying ahead. But there was a, there was a big but to this thing. Uh, carrying it was rather a health hazard, since she told him that whoever the banner was carried on behalf of would be victorious. But the poor slob who got the job of actually holding the damn thing was going belly up. She says, Had I thought you might live forever, I'd have reared you in my wool basket. But lifetimes are shaped by what will be, not by where you are. Now take this banner. I've made it for you with all the skill I have, and my belief is this. It will bring victory to the man it's carried before, but death to the one who carries it. How nice. Oh well. Now the, the banner, the banner seems to have done everything she expected of it. Sigurd gaining a victory. But the first man who carried the banner was killed, as also were the next two who took it up. Mother's prophecy seemed to be uncomfortably correct, at least for the guy who had the damn thing in his hand. Had there been a request for someone to grab up that banner, I personally would have taken a few steps backwards very fast. Anyway, in 1014 AD, Jarl Sigurd sailed to Ireland, along with Jarl Brodil's man, to assist the King of Dublin, Sidric Olufsen, against Pring Brian Boru, the self-styled Ard Ri, or High King of Ireland, who was trying to take the Kingdom of Dyflin for himself. A noble attempt to assist fellow Norse people, along with their Gaelic allies. And a great battle ensued, a battle so fierce that it was said the river Tolka ran red with blood. Now Sigurd naturally fought beneath his raven banner, and it seemed to be doing its job rather well. He, he was getting on splendidly. Oh, he was slaughtering the Irish left, right and centre. But once again, those who carried it for him began to discover that standard bearer was a terminal position, something that, you know, something that probably hadn't been mentioned at the, at the job interview. Congratulations, Eric. You got the job of standard bearer. Unfortunately, you will die, but think of the glory of your wonderful heroic death. You will feast with Odin in Valhall till Ragnarok shall come. No, I, uh, I, I doubt very much anyone actually said that. A number of men were killed as they carried the banner. A man would fall bravely, and another would seize the banner and hold it aloft, only to go belly up rather quickly, until the banner eventually fell to the ground. The saga of Burnt Njol tells it thus. Then Earl Sigurd called on Thorstein, the son of Hall of the Side, to bear the banner, and Thorstein was about to lift the banner, but then Osmond the White said, Don't bear the banner, for all they who bear it get their death. Half in the red, called out Earl Sigurd. Bear thou the banner. Bear thine own devil thyself, answered Halfin. Then the earl said, Tis fittest that the beggar should bear the bag. And with that he took the banner from the staff and put it under his cloak. Not long after that, Osmond the White was killed, even though he hadn't, well, he hadn't actually touched the banner, but he had, I suppose, insulted it. And Jarl Sigurd, now the bearer of his own banner, was promptly impaled on an enemy spear. Well, Mother had warned him what would happen to those who, who carried the thing, so, you know, when he ran out of volunteer standard bearers, he might have been better off to just you know, stick it in the ground and leave it where it was. In the saga, it says, There was no man who would bear the raven standard, and the earl bore it himself and fell there. You should have listened to Mother. See, Mother, mother knows best. Of course, why she had put a curse on the damn thing in the first place is, is a bit hard to understand. It didn't make, you know, it didn't make it any better in battle. In fact, it made it a lot worse because nobody wanted to carry it. Uh, and it got Jarl Sigurd killed in the end. Mm, but she did. P perhaps, perhaps it was the old idea that magic comes with a price. You know, nothing is ever free of consequences. And I suppose a spear shown through one's guts would be highly consequential. 
Oh, well. <clears throat> anyway, they, 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 I, I really cannot explain that one. I simply present the facts. After considerable slaughter spread over a large area, Brian's side won the battle, though he himself and both his son and his grandson were killed, as were Maelmorda, Brodier, and, of course, Sigurd of the Cursed Banner with a spear through his guts. The Norse forces were unable to make their escape due to the high tide, which had caused their ships all to float too far offshore to make it easy to reach them. All right, who forgot to bring the anchor stones? And they suffered heavy casualties as a result. King Brian, I'm sorry to say, did not die heroically in battle, leading his forces. He himself had taken actually no part in the fighting. He, I mean, he, he was 73 years old, after all. And his role in it had been to pray in his tent. Whatever his prayers may have done for the battle, they certainly didn't do very much for Brian himself, since Brodier and Mann, uh, retreating from the last battle, came into the tent and killed Brian as he prayed, before being killed himself shortly afterwards. I think King Brian really needed better security. I mean, was, 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 was nobody watching the tent flap? Anyway, as to King Silkbeard, now you're probably wondering, well, you know, what was he doing? What was he doing in all this? Well, he had very wisely stayed in Diffin, holding the garrison in reserve, just in case. Well, that was his story, at least, and I'm sure he stuck to it. And his participation in the actual fighting, well, that amounted to watching the various standards waving around in the distance as the battle progressed. The other standards, at least, not killing those who bore them. And not only did he survive uh, his holding his men in reserve, having paid off rather well, but he continued as King of Dyflin on and off up to 1036 AD. The battle that has always been seen, for some reason, as a, as a defining moment, freeing Ireland from foreign rule, though in effect it had very little real influence on that, uh, Norse control continued in the country, uh, but declining, uh, intermarriage between Norse and Gael, and increasing conversion to Christianity, adding considerably to that effect, uh, and the same Hiberno-Norse king continued to rule Dublin for another 22 years, after the battle that supposedly drove out the Vikings. Um, as I say, the Norse, uh, Norse control was already considerably decri uh, declining in Ireland due to various uh, factors. So the battle really well, it didn't have a, a great effect uh, as such uh, on that. Anyway, that was the historical Battle of Clontarf seen so often as a pivotal moment in history that, in actual fact, had very little to do with anything at all. The subsequent history of Ireland would have been very much the same had the battle never been fought, or indeed if the Norse and different Irish had won it. Norse control in Ireland was already on the decline, as I said. Christianity was now the dominant religion, and the subsequent history of Ireland and the eventual Norman conquest would probably have been exactly the same. Now, to the theatrical version, a somewhat smaller battle, uh, to be sure, a bit condensed, with about ten warriors on each side, which was about as many as we could fit onto the stage with any degree of safety while swinging swords about. As it turned out, that was a very good thing. The play was entitled Let the Ravens Feed, with the alternate title of Coromlada, she being the wife of one of the participants in the Battle of Clontarf, and it featured the events leading up to and including the famous battle. And opening night was Friday, December the 5th, 1969, in the little Peacock Theatre, which is situated under and is part of Dublin's famous Abbey Theatre. I was Lorcan, a warrior. Well, among other things, most of the cast playing, playing several parts. And that role came close to ending my theatrical career in a rather spectacular manner, which is the main point of this video. Bear with me, it, it, it's worth... It's worth waiting for. Anyway, the play became rather famous in the world of the Dublin theatre at the time, though for all the wrong reasons. What was intended to be a serious historical play, and there was nothing wrong with the play itself, it was quite good, it ended up like something from Monty Python or Mel Brooks. To begin with, the costume designer, for some reason best known to themselves, possibly having a bout of temporary insanity at the time, decided to standardise the costumes at least for the men. The, the women got individual dresses to wear, yes. And frankly, I would have much preferred to have worn a dress, because I, along with the rest of the male cast, was dressed in tunic and pants made of hessian fabric. Yes, hessian fabric. Which gave the impression that we were wearing coal sacks with holes cut in them for the head and arms. 
Now, for those not old enough to remember the 60s, coal was often delivered in large Hessian sacks. And there was standardised footwear as well, uh, at least for the men. The, the women, once again, were spared the creative insanity of the costume designer getting shoes to wear. Yes, real, real, actual shoes. Oh, I kid you not. But we got, we got rubber boots. Yes, rubber boots. Wellington boots, made by Dunlop. Now, I may be wrong. I may be wrong, even even I do make mistakes, but I very much doubt that anybody at the Battle of Clontarf wore rubber Wellington boots made by Dunlop or anybody else, since rubber wasn't discovered by Europeans until 1735. The very obvious impossible modernity of the wellies, as they were called, as we all clumped around on the stage, you know, you can't walk elegantly in wellies, you sort of plod, like a, a farmer walking over a ploughed field. That raised titters enough, but what, what really made the name of the production, uh, literally, was the death of Brian Boru. Now, it, it's important, it's very important to the story, to understand that the Peacock is an intimate theatre. It seats 150 people, and the front row of the audience well, you know, that's only a few feet from the edge of the stage. If I was sitting in the front row, those shelves behind me would be the stage. King Brian was dead. He was laid out on a bier to be mourned by his faithful warriors and kinsmen. The king is dead. He has given his life for dear old Aaron. A sad and supposed to be moving scene. One that will live on in the history of Ireland. Tears will be shed at the recounting of it. A solemn moment. Unfortunately, our version of it wasn't. See, playing dead bodies on stage, especially in intimate theatres like the Peacock, is challenging because actors have to breathe. And the chest of a corpse going up and down, you know, it rather spoils the, the dead effect. Lying dead on a beer for some considerable time, trying only to take tiny, unnoticeable breaths, is not something actors really like to do. So, the director had a brainwave. Oh, yes, our boy was a genius. King Brian wouldn't be laid out sideways to the audience, which would be the usual method of staging such a scene. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. There's a kiss the clever bit now. He'd be laid out with his feet towards the audience. Thus, any problem of breathing would be taken care of. The audience would be unable to see it. Excellent. All they would see from the house would be his feet. And they did. Uh, since the king was feet first towards the audience, who were only, only, you know, only a few feet away, remember, the soles of his boots were clearly visible, as was the word Dunlop on them in very large, raised, uppercase letters, right across the sole. The overhead stage lighting, of course, well, throwing the letters into high relief, making them even more obvious than they would otherwise have been. Unfortunately, the director didn't seem to notice that fact at the dress rehearsals. On opening night, the audience did. They, uh, they laughed. They laughed on every night after that as well. We, we in the cast christened the play The Wellington Boot Show. A title that gained uh, some notoriety around Dublin theatrical circles. Have you seen the Wellington Boot Show over, over at the Peacock? Ah, uh, you have to see it. They're all wearing coal sacks and wellies, for feck's sake. Yes. <coughs> hmm. Now, I know I know. Oscar Wilde said that the, the only bad publicity is no publicity, but I don't think he had big rubber boots that sort of flop when you walk in them, being used for a play set in 1014 AD in mind when he said it. Of course, nobody had the common sense to just turn King Brian around with his head towards the audience. No, I mean, that, no, that, would, that would have been too easy. But that wasn't all. There were other unfortunate events before we even got the curtain up on opening night. And I, I, I haven't got anywhere near my own personal story yet, but bear with me, bear with me. It is worth waiting for, trust me. We had a carefully rehearsed battle scene, choreographed for both effect and safety, and we spent we spent quite a lot of rehearsal time on it. Now, we had sticks, uh, broom handles and the like uh, for that. They were good enough to rehearse with. The actual swords didn't put in an appearance until the dress rehearsal. Comes the dress rehearsals. Ah, well, all went fairly well, up to the Battle of Clontarf. But there we ran into a yeah, slight problem. 
You see, we had all the weapons from the property department. There, there, there wasn't really ever much call for swords suitable for the 11th century. But we had what there was, just enough to go around. But half the warriors had real swords. Uh, real, real swords, uh, something, well, something like this one. No, not sharp, of course. I mean, the edge is quite blunt. But this is still a real sword. It's made of steel and, and it's rather heavy. The other half of the warriors, however, had wooden prop swords made of light wood, something well, something like balsa wood that, you know, you make little model planes and things out of, painted silver to look like metal and intended to be carried for effect, but not actually used. Note, never take a balsa wood sword to a real sword fight. Not good. The, the Battle of Kantaf lasted oh, about a minute or so, after which half the army uh, still had swords, the, the real ones, while the others just had the hilt left in their hand, and the stage was littered with bits of wood and splinters. Oh, shit. Quick, call the theatrical costumiers. Call Ardmore Movie Studios. Get any swords they have. Well, a few phone calls later, we managed to get enough real swords to go around, and so the great battle could go ahead on opening night without us having to resort to hand-to-hand -hand unarmed combat like a Hong Kong Kung Fu movie. Now, now... At last comes my personal story. I know you've been waiting with bated breath for this moment. Well, now it's here. I had a dramatic fight rehearsed with another actor in which we would savagely attack one another for a short time with our swords, after which I would run my opponent through with my sword in the standard theatrical manner, which is basically shoving it like that, you know, past him, uh, upstage of the audience so it would seem to go straight through him. He would then clutch his guts and stagger off stage to die. So as not to clutter up the rather small stage with bodies lying around. Very impressive, very impressive. And what was good was that we would be right down by the edge of the stage, centre stage as well. So for a few moments we would have almost the full attention of the audience on us. What a moment! All 150 of them would be watching us. Unfortunately, as it turned out, as I faced my opponent, sword in hand, ready to do battle, I, I noticed there was, there was something rather odd about him. He, he seemed somewhat unsteady on his feet, and there was a, a strong smell of whiskey that seemed to envelop him like an alcoholic cocoon that moved around with him. Oh shit, he's pissed. He looked at me with a, a strange, somewhat unsettling expression on his face, a malevolent smile as he rocked slightly to and fro, murmuring something to himself. Then he laughed, as evil, sort of laugh. <laughs> and he charged! He gave a great roar. Ah! And he ran at me like a bull at a gate, sword raised. Now, as I said, the fight was carefully rehearsed. Strike high, strike low, block, thrust, parry. Every move performed over and over until we could do it at full speed. That oh-so-careful planning, of course, went straight out the window along with the empty bottle of whatever it was he'd consumed in the dressing room. I, I, I was expecting a blow towards my leg, ready to block it. He swung at my head. Fortunately, my reflexes were good, or I wouldn't be telling you about it now, and I was able to block the blow, though perhaps my, my move was somewhat lacking in style and grace. It was a bit like, oh, shit! The next carefully rehearsed blow should have been at my head, but he swung at my leg, full force. Again, I blocked it. Shit! He was, he was swinging at me as hard as he could with a real sword, laughing. <laughs> and it was obvious he was trying to hit me. What, what should have been a, a simulated stage combat had become a real fight. We, we were genuinely fighting. The little bastard was trying to kill me. And, and I was trying to prevent that uh, terminal outcome. Now, the other warriors had noticed this, and they were sort of... Moving away, giving us room, since our, our swords were going places 
none of them had expected. And, of course, by now they'd caught the overpowering whiff of alcohol that was moving around with my opponent. He'd been partaking of the juice of the barley in his dressing room, so nobody had noticed his inebriated state until his arrival on stage. Now, I realized I had to kill him quickly and get him off the stage before somebody got hurt, especially me. You know, forget the prearranged fight and just get him off. So I grabbed his sword arm. I thrust my sword apparently through him. I pulled it back out and waited for him to stagger off stage and die. He laughed. He had just been run through with a sword, and he stood there and tittered like a schoolgirl being tickled with a feather. <laughs> By this time, the audience had noticed. I mean, they're only a few feet away, for feck's sake. We're right down at the edge of the stage, and I just stabbed a man who seemed to think being skewered with a sword through his guts was on a par with the funniest joke he'd ever heard. All eyes were on us. The Battle of Clontarf had sort of slowed behind us. They were, they, were, they were all sort of watching us, right down there, centre stage, unsure of what to do, and fighting almost in slow motion. By this time, he should be dead, and I should be engaging someone else. You know, there were men waiting for prearranged action with me, which, of course, I couldn't do, since I was occupied with the moving pub. I ran him through again. Ah! And I whispered, Die! Which, at that moment, I wished he really would do. He seemed to think that was absolutely side splitting. <laughs> I was sorely tempted to make the fight even more realistic than it already was and beat him to death with my sword. I had to put an end to this. So I put a foot behind his leg, pushed him backwards, and I took him down on the ground, flat on his back. Die, you bastard! I whispered in a stage whisper, though, though in the tiny peacock it would have been quite audible right at the back. He was still cackling happily. <laughs> I took my sword in both hands as I straddled him. I raised it high in the air, the blade gleaming in the lights, every eye in the audience fixed on that deadly blade, ready to bring down death. And I brought it down with a mighty shout. Ah! Apparently skewering him to the ground. He jerked, and he twitched, and he laughed hysterically. <laughs> he was like a beetle on a pin, sort of going round and round, and I gave up. I stood up and I left him going off to fight the next man I was supposed to engage, who was pretty much just standing there waiting for me, trying to look like he was actually doing something other than standing there waiting for me. The fell warrior run through repeatedly and pinned to the ground with a sword thrust, got up, giggling to himself, <laughs> as he wobbled back into the battle, swinging his sword in all directions. <laughs> he was finally dragged off the stage, still laughing, by a couple of actors, brave enough to go near him. I can only imagine the audience's puzzlement. Who was this seemingly immortal warrior? A man who could not be killed by any human weapon. What, was he perhaps actually a god? Was he Thor or Tyr, come down through Oscala to join the battle? Yeah, I, I, I think it's fair to say that the Battle of Clontarf lost much of the dramatic, blood-soaked terror of combat that it was supposed to represent. The fear, the horror, the, the insanity of battle. Well, I, I suppose we, we got the insanity bit right, at least. What should have been a gripping moment of horrendous conflict was reduced to something out of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. All we needed was the Knights of Meat to show up. That concludes this little look at my theatrical connections with the famous Battle of Clontarf. Long ago as it was, the Wellington Boot Show lives on in my memory. I can't forget it. I have tried. But we managed to take that production to such glorious Olympian heights of underachievement that it lives on in my mind as fresh as had it occurred yesterday. If badness was rewarded, you know, that that production would have won an Oscar, a Grammy, and any other performance award you can think of, it would have swept the board. I am, I am rather proud of it, though, in one way, and that is my skill with the sword. I can honestly say that I have engaged in actual combat 
I have been in battle, not the simulated rehearsed battles of those Viking reenactment events. No, no, a genuine battle in which my life was at risk, in which I fought heroically against a savage, uncontrolled opponent, and I survived. Yes, I, I do feel, uh, I do feel quite, quite proud uh, of that as it happens. So, until the next time, I shall say farewell. Oh, 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 and, and one other, one other little thing, a tip. For those of you who may be involved in you know, amateur theatricals or, or, or whatever, if you fancy taking a drink, just wait till the, the final curtain comes down, all right? Yeah? Please, do that for me. Bye for now.